hidden, I mean hide and seek. Hide and seek. You ever play hide and seek when you're a little kid? I love playing hide and seek with my grandkids because they giggle all the time. You can find them really easy. And our house isn't that big anyway. But they'll run into the bathroom downstairs or they'll run behind the couch or underneath the chair and uh, uh, they'll make a lot of noise and of course it's very easy to find them. And, and uh, I remember, uh, well, I, liked, I enjoyed watching Amy play with the kids, you know, because she'll play and they'll try to hide. And Isaac will go once corner and then Isabella has to follow him. And he's like, no, go away, go away, because you know, they'll find me, you know. But uh, they make a lot of noise and you can find them easy. And uh, even when I played with my kids years and years ago, I, I, I used to enjoy it. The fun part was hiding so they'd have to find me. Right, and then after you know 15 minutes or so, you kind of make a little noise so they think they hear you. Right? You ever do that, where you hide with the kids and, and you let them find you? And so we used to, I used to hide in my closet in our bedroom so I could get behind the clothes and they wouldn't be able to find me. Even if they looked in the closet, they would never go actually look in the closet. Um, and then you just scare them, right? You go ah, and, uh, and they would laugh and we would laugh and have a good time. But anyway, it was like it, it, I, I just love doing that. I love. Um, uh, just that adventure of finding and just the silliness of watching the kids having a good time trying to hide on you. And the reason I titled this Hide and Seek is because we're going to be coming, um, I mean, if you will, if you will, go to uh, John chapter 6 is where we're going to be teaching out of today, or most of this morning. Uh, but I'm going to go to Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 17, and I'm going to read that again. It's kind of a theme that we're going to go, be preaching out of the, this whole summer. Uh, about our great inheritance from God, and we're just going to make some points today to help us understand who we are in Christ, um, how special you are to God, some of your names. We last week Tina taught, and it was on uh, one of the names that we found out that we were called by God was Hephzibah. Hephzibah means what? That God delights in you. Amen. I've never heard that before. I mean, I was in church for all my life as a, as a young boy. I never heard God liked me or was delighted in me. Amen. I always found out I was not good enough or measured up enough, you know? I was always, uh, uh, and then when I got promoted to uh, a different denomination, if you will, I found out I was a sinner. And I always was a sinner. And I was going to be a sinner forever. No matter what, I've always sinned. And uh, I remember the day we rebelled. Some of you already know that story, but the uh, pastor was in the pulpit and he was telling us how we were all sinners. And we all sin every day. And if you didn't sin this, you know, he says, this is how I say it. If you sin this morning, raise your hand. And everybody in the church, and it was probably about 30 or 40, maybe 50 people, they would all raise their hands. And I'm like, I told Tina one day, I said, uh, after we've been going there for a while, and it was one of those times where we were just in love with God. You know, we didn't know nothing about the Bible, we just were reading it, you know. We didn't study, we just couldn't get enough. And we'd pray for our friends, and they would come and know Jesus, and we'd be worshiping God, because we got a couple worship. Uh, LPs, I guess, no, uh, cassette, tapes. cassette tapes or whatever, and we would listen to that over and over and over because it was, it was music and we, it was worshiping God and we never heard music like that before because we grew up in a different uh, stream of life. And so uh, we'd worship God and we'd go to church in the morning on Sunday morning we'd just be worshiping. And the pastor would say, everybody's a sinner and you all sin this morning, so raise your hand and I turned to Tina one morning. I remember that rebellious morning. I turned to her. I said, did you sin this morning? She goes, no. I said, I haven't either. I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I mean, the pastor got upset with us. He preached at us for about 45 minutes telling how, much, how bad we were. But I found out, you know what? As I studied the Word of God, I found out God loves us. And He cares about us. And He wants you to be happy. Come on. He wants us to be happy. And He wants us to know us. So, Anyway, so we're going, to, we're going to talk about this. He wants you to be satisfied. Come on. He wants you to have power and love. He wants you to be... He wants you to know that you are his children. And he's proud of you. Amen? We always talk about behavior. We always talk about things that we do. But you know what? The bottom line, God loves you. And he cares about you. And he's really happy with you. Amen? Come on, put a smile on your face. Let's see. Okay, there you go. All right, Revelation, I'm going to read this just real quick. It says, to, in verse 17, Revelation 2, 17 says this, To him who overcomes, 
I, I will give them to eat hidden manna. To, let me say it again. To him who overcomes, I will give them to eat hidden manna. Now everybody knows what the manna is, right? Exodus chapter 16 talks about the manna. The children of Israel grumbling, God provided for them food. He gave them manna. And what does the ant manna mean? What does the word manna mean? What is it? God gave him this, this nice, fluffy food, angel food, I guess. Came down from heaven, landed on the ground. All they did was pick up enough for the day, right? And on the Sabbath day, they had enough for two days. And if they didn't obey that, that food would just satisfy them. And they, they would get everything they needed. And we know that the, the manna uh, was sweet, just like the word of God. Amen? We know it is, it is um, we know it's white. We know that um, it came from heaven. We also know manna is seed. It was a seed. The word of God is a seed. We know the word of God grows. We know that the word of God is like, to me, do you ever make like fresh bread at home? Have you ever made bread in the oven? Or in a bread maker? You know what I'm talking about? And my father-in-law makes bread for us every Christmas. He makes special bread. My mom used to make bread all the time because we had six of us and we didn't have a lot. So we had fresh bread. Grandma and mom would make bread and we'd have these fresh loaves of bread. And it was like, I don't know why they made it because it only didn't last but a day anyway because we had six of us. We just devoured it because the fresh bread was so good. And it got hot out of the oven just enough so we could put some, some butter on it, right? As we sliced it, it would just melt in that bread and you would just, it would just, it wouldn't even, you wouldn't have to eat it. It would just melt in your mouth. And it's better than ice cream. It was so good. We just love it, right? And I think the Word of God, as we devour it, as we partake of it, as we desire it, it becomes like that. It comes that fresh bread. It comes, it's satisfying. It changes us. And as we go a little bit further, I'm going to share with you. And um, let's turn to John chapter 6. I'm gonna, I want to read this whole section to you. Do you mind if I spend a little bit of time like, going through the Word? Is that okay? This, this section of the Word, God showed me something in the Word. Uh, this week as I was studying this out. I don't know if I'll get to all my points. First point is uh, hidden manna, which is the word of God, uh, hidden treasures, and hidden glory. God wants to reveal to us. This part, this section in John chapter 6 talks about Jesus being the bread of life. And this was right after he fed the 5,000 the bread. Remember he broke the little loaves of bread that the little boy had and the fishes and he it was able to feed like 5,000 people on a couple pieces of bread. Amen. How did God do that? How did God take them little loaves of bread? Jesus said he broke it, and then he gave thanks for it, and then he fed 5,000 men, women, and children, which could have been more than up to 15,000 people almost, on a couple of pieces of bread. He just took it and broke it and blessed it. Something about breaking and something about blessing. How many pray over your food every day? Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. Or, Father, bless our food, amen. You know, just kind of, you don't really think about it. But think about how those prayers are just, I mean, we need to really think about thanking Him, and then God will multiply what you have. Hallelujah. How many ever pray over your finances? I don't ever have enough finances, right? But what if you broke it, you gave what you're supposed to give, and then just pray over it, and God bless it, and what would happen? Would it multiply? Huh? Yeah. Anybody believe that? Yes. One person? Two of you. Okay, okay, just trying to check. We have to do some teaching on that again. Anyway, I'm going to have Tina help me read this today. Uh, I want to read uh, a, a lot um, of this section. I want you to get it because when we get to verse 40, I'm going to go crazy, all right? Just to let you know right now. Um, I, I'm excited about what God revealed to me. I want to share it with you. So let's look at verse. If you follow along in your Bible, Tina, you have the, just do the NIV or the New King James Version. And we're starting verse 32. And I'm going to kind of start and stop. We're going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 32. We're going to start there. If, do you guys want, do you have a Bible? Do you want one? You have your iPhone? You can use your iPhone. It's got 20 different versions on it. But if you need one, you, does anybody want a Bible? There's some in the back. Tom, would you help get some of those? For, if anybody wants one. Okay. We're going to start at verse 32. And then, um, hopefully we'll get the rest of this. I don't know, but go ahead, Tina. Are you going to put it up there? Good, thank you. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not 
Moses, who has given you the bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, stop. So, who is the bread of life? Who is? This is the bread of life. The bread is of God. It is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And that is, everybody say it together. Jesus. Jesus. That's right. It's Jesus. So Jesus is the bread of life. Everybody here knows that, right? You all know that? Most of us know that. Matter of fact, when pastor asks a question, if you say Jesus, you'll probably be right 90% of the time. Okay? Jesus. So what's the answer? Jesus is always the answer. So he's the answer here. He's describing who the bread of life is. It says in verse 34, Tina. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Okay, listen to this. This is a key. Why did Jesus come? What was the will of the Father? This is the next verse. Go ahead. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those who he has given to me, but raise them up at the last day. Perfect. For my Father's will is, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. All right, stop. We're going to teach a basic gospel principle that every one of us need to know. If you already know this, great. I want to encourage you to be strong in that and share that. But look at what the Word of God says here. It says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes. So there's two parts to this. I'm going to... Um, look at today. It says everyone that looks, or in another version, the New King James Version says everyone that beholds everyone that beholds the Son of God and believes. So is there two parts? To, who's an English major here? There's two parts to this, right? There's two parts. So everyone who looks to the Son of God, now not just physically look at Him, right? Because that's not what the word look really means here. The word look means behold. So those that long for, those that want to be with those that desire to have this Jesus. Amen? Because if you look up the word believe, you find, and I've shared this many times, the word believe in John 3.16 says, for, the, for, for whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, John 3.16, everybody knows it, right? The word believe there means adapt to it and hear your life too. There's more than just believing, because we find out in Scripture that even the devil believes, but we know his destination, right? We know his end. So it's more than just believing. And this, this word here in John, John repeats that again, and says, those that desire to look, to be with, to have Jesus. So it's not just a, a mental exercise anymore. It's also a physical thing. I want to touch him. I want to be with him. I want to have him. It's more than just saying, yeah, the Jesus of the Bible, that guy, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm cool with that. It's more than that. It's willing to sacrifice your life for, not only mentally, but physically, for this Jesus. It's more than just, I'm looking at him. See, sometimes the English language just kind of doesn't give the whole depth of this. That's why I love the, have you ever, um, do I have my phone there? BlueLetterBible.com or .org. I'm not sure which one it is. BlueLetterBible.org. It has a, a, the strong concordance. It's got um, uh, helps in there. You just click on the verse and it breaks down every word in there. It's really easy. It's all done for you. You don't have to really study real hard. Just use that. It's a great tool that you can use. BlueLetterBible.org, I think, is what it is. And I use that uh, um, every week. Um, it's just a great tool to help you to understand the fullness of what the Word of God is saying here. So you say, well, Pastor, what's the big deal? It's just look. It's seeking after him. If I seek him, the word of God says, I will find him. 
So there's something you have to do. It's not just a fact of acknowledging. That's why I just, I love church. I love celebrating. I love coming together on Sunday morning. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm the first one up in the morning. I'm excited. Can't wait to get my cup of coffee in the words, going over my sermon notes. I'm the first one here in the morning. I, just, I love it. But we have to seek Him not Sunday morning. We have to seek Him every day, every moment of our lives. Because He wants to be intimately involved in everything that you do. Amen? Come on, don't get back. I'm not beating you up now. Come on, just, this is a happy time. This is like, hey, we can know God. We can know the heart of the Father. We can like communicate with Him every day. I mean, it's a happy thing. It's like walking down the, the, the sidewalk or down the path with God, and God has His arm around you, walking life with you. Is that okay? He wants to do that with you every day, more and more. More and more now that you see the day drawing near of His return. More and more, seek the assembling together so we can encourage each other in the faith because things are looking dim around the world. Amen? I was thinking about, uh, I was just thinking about, uh, there's so many things that I'm, I'm thinking about right now, but I just try, try to stay on track here. There was a, a story in the paper or in the, uh, uh, on the internet from, is, from Syria. I read a, a few things that are happening to Jerusalem right now, and so I get these articles. There was eight, eight or six men that were crucified in the center of the uh, town, I can't remember the town in Syria, because they would not uh, revert back to Islam uh, and they would not deny Christ. And so they, they hung them on crosses. That's one of their ways of it. The, is, what is it, the new Hamas and those other guys. One of their favorite... ISIS. Uh, the, the, was it ISIS? ISIS? Those guys, you know, you hear about in the news now. They they like to crucify seeing Christians on crosses. They just had metal crosses they hung them to, and they killed them. I don't know if they killed them before they put them up there or whatever. The point is, they did not deny Christ unto death. My point. Because they looked and they followed and desired to be with Christ more than their own life. Not even be quiet and concerned. Because in the world we have missionaries dying for this, for this right here, for this very purpose, that that the Son of God would be glorified to the Son, uh, to everyone. God said He wouldn't lose any of them, right? Mm -hmm. And they will raise with Him in the last days. So even though they died physically in this world, they will raise with Him in, in the last days. So what I'm trying to encourage you today is: listen, we have to not only believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we have to be willing to give our lives for Jesus. As a son of God. How many would do that today? Don't raise your hand. All my international friends always raise their hand because they know. Americans take forever to figure that out. They even reason out in their mind. I don't know. I mean, how do I die? I don't know. They hung Jesus on a cross and made fun of him for, you know, and they beat him and whipped him for a couple days. I mean, what would they do to you? I don't know. But it is worth it. Because the Bible says, as soon as you take your last breath, you'll be present with Him. I know it's supposed to be a happy sermon today, right? Why? Why do I want you to go to Power Love Conference? Why do I want you to experience with God through His power using you to see somebody get saved or get healed or delivered? Because I want you to have that. I want you to know what that power is. Because we're going to have to rely on that power someday. Amen? God said he revealed to us the hidden manna. He said, I, I saw this, I said, oh my goodness, we have, to, we, have to, we, have to real, we have to realize that we have to not only look upon, go back to the, the verse before, right? Uh, 40, go to the one ahead, Richard. It says, not only have to, that, it says, for the, my Father's will, this is God the Father's will, that Jesus came and died for all of us, right? He said, will is that everyone, that's you and me, correct? Every one of us will look, will desire. Well, not this word desire, this word look here, not only mentally, but physically look upon Jesus and, 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 and have him for our own. And um, look about the Son and believe in him. The word believe here is the same word in John 3.16, that we adapt and adhere our life to him. In him shall have eternal life. So we'll have eternal life. And I will raise 
him or her up in the last days. What is the last days? Are we in the last days? Does anybody have an idea where we're at in time? I remember evangelists coming to my church in, in, um, in when we were in uh, 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 North Carolina. And he would, say, he would say to us as evangelists, you know, you've got to make a decision for Jesus right now. So they, they'd get everybody all hyped up about Jesus coming back, right? He said, we're in the, we're in the 11th hour and the 59th minute. Jesus is going to come back in, in, in just a short amount of time. That was almost 40 years ago. So I was like, wow, Jesus. But our, our days and time are not like God's, are they? But we can see. Jesus said, you can see what's happening in the world right now and be prepared. I think even if Jesus doesn't come back in my lifetime, I'm still going to be ready. Come on. I don't, I don't know if Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I don't know if he's coming back 10 years from now, but I'm not going to wait 10 years to figure it out. I want to be ready right now. I'm going to believe with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. So one of my prayers, and I hope it's yours too, God, help my unbelief. Help me not to unbelieve, not, not, help, me, help me always to believe that the word of God is true. Help me always to believe that you are the son of God. Help me always to believe, Father God, that you love me. And no matter what the enemy call, throws at me, no matter what past, my past, how messed up it's been, how he throws it up in my face all the time, I mean, no, I'm not going to, I'm still going to believe because I know the power of God is life. And the gift of that is eternal life for each and every one of us and those that believe. Amen? Hallelujah. The hidden man fell all over the Israel camp. Jesus is that hidden, is that manna that we can partake of, we can gather. That was interesting in, in, um, in the Ark of the Covenant, right? There's the Ten Commandments, right? There's the, the Ten Commandments right there, the second copy, if you will. Then there's the rod that Aaron had in the, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? The Ark had the rod in it from uh, Aaron that budded when the children came out of, Israel, out of Egypt, and then there was a copy of the Ten Commandments, uh, version two of it, was just like the first one. And then there was what else was in that ark? There's only one other thing that was in the ark. Do you anybody remember? Yeah. Man, there was a cup, if you will, golden cup with Ephraim, full of manna. Why was that put in there? Why was, what, was the, what did the manna represent? The word of God, right? And the word of God, and John tells us, is Jesus, John 1. So that manna was preserved so that the children of Israel would know that, that their Savior is in Jesus. Amen? Not in sacrificing animals, and not, but in the word, in Jesus. And that's who Jesus is today. You un, open that, that, if you will, you open up that vessel, and you partake of that, if you will, in the word of God. I can't read Hebrew or Greek, so I have to use English. And in this, because of my hunger and because of my desire to know him, he reveals himself to me. He's not really hidden anymore because I'm seeking after him. Amen? He's not really paying hide and go seek, is he? He says, you come looking for me, and it'd be like a parent, like me hiding in that closet, my kids looking for me, and all of a sudden I make a little noise. Amen? And then, ha ha, I found you. And when I read this this week, I said, I don't know if you got as excited as I did, but when I read that, I said, look, there's two parts of this. You have to mentally and physically look for him. And you'll find him. Because when you do, you're going to believe that he is the Son of God. And your life is going to change for the glory. Amen? I find, can I just go there? I find that Christians that don't read the Word of God on a regular basis have struggled with this. Amen? If, and I tell people, you don't have to be a member of Capital City Church. As a matter of fact, I'd rather you don't. Just show up and, and support the ministry that, that's going on here. Amen? Membership it has nothing to do with your eternal your salvation. Just desire Jesus. Desire Him. Know Him. And then your life will reflect Christ. Amen? Okay. Uh, amen. 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 If you're happy, you look like that. All right. Um, we were children pastors for a long time, so, you know, we just, it's fun to be in church. It should be fun to be in church. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Hidden treasures. Point number two. It says, the kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field. Matthew 13, 44. Um, this shows the, um, the uh, treasure. Remember the, uh, 
the, they would buy a, buy a field just so I could have the, the treasure that's in it, amen? Sell everything you have so I can know Jesus. De desire Him more than anything. I was listening to some, um, I'm going to share with the board tonight a little bit, but I'll share with you a little bit today, right now. You know, we have to change the way we do church in a sense that we're really more effective in our community, right? So there's a new term for some young preachers out there, and I'm not young by any means, so I just, you know, I like to listen to those guys because, you know, God's always doing something new every morning. Proverbs, right? And I just want to learn. New doesn't always mean different, just means just a new way of doing things sometimes. And the, the young guys, the younger group, if you will, pastors and ministers, they got this term called missional community. Does anybody ever heard that? Missional community. If you were my cell group, you I mean, my life group, you know you've already heard it. But if you haven't, missional community, what, is it, what does that mean? Jesus says everyone is on a mission and we're in a community. Hello? Angel, you live in a community over there, right? Where your apartment complex is, right? That's your, your mission right there. Our mission, uh, if you will, it, our missional community is the people we live around. Your missional community, I believe, is where you live around. The people that live next door to you, uh, if you live in an apartment complex, that live above you or below you, are people that you are required, I believe, by God to lead to Jesus. If you live in a neighborhood, your neighbor to your right and left, they should, at a minimum, know you go to church on Sunday. Right? But they should know the love of God through you. Those are, that's your mission field. I believe God gave you the talent, the skills, the knowledge that you have to do the job you do so he can equip you with finance to do his ministry, not to gain things for yourself. Hold, let me say that again. That's, that was good. Huh? God gave you talent, skills, knowledge, education, a job to finance your mission field so you can do his work for him every day. Amen? So wait a second, no, I, I, I grew up in America. I gotta I got get a boat, I gotta get two cars, I gotta get a nice house, I gotta get nice furniture, I gotta, this is all about me. And I believe we missed it, America. I believe we missed it. I believe we, we bought into a lie in the American dream. It was never about us. It was always supposed to glorify Jesus. The treasures that you have are for the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to raise an extra offering today by any means. All I'm saying is, what you have is support your meat, so you can eat every day and you can clothe yourself so you can do the work of the ministry. Amen? If you've got a nice house, some of you, us do, that you should invite all your neighbors to your house. Feed them a meal. You know, this is one thing that I've learned about this, listening to these young preachers, right? Everybody eats every, how many eats every day? You eat every day? Everybody eats every day. You know, every country, come on, every country outside of America, the, the neighbors come and they all eat together. It's a community. Right? I was listening to Pastor Andrew, and um, Pastor Andrew, uh, some of the people from his church, and they're from Ghana, Africa. And, he, and one of the young guys was saying, yeah, when I come home from work, it's like the whole neighborhood gets together, we all eat together, we all cook together. It's like this, this big family event every evening for the evening meal. That's all that, that particular, uh, where he lives, it's the village that he lives in. It's like, but when he came to America, now he's in this little box house or apartment, and he never meets his neighbor, because now we're just stuck in these little boxes, and it's all about me. Uh, my new TV, my, uh, uh, I don't even know what game controllers they use now. Anyway, so, um, uh, Wii, Xbox, whatever, whatever, I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? It's all about entertaining self. It's all about entertaining self. It's all about us. It's not about bringing our neighbors to get to know us so we can, someone Jesus can fall off on, on, off of us onto them. And the love of God, well, why are you, why are you doing this? Because I just... I want you to know, hey, we care about you. So we're doing this in our neighborhood in a couple weeks. We're inviting our neighbors to come to our house to have a barbecue out back, which is really nice. Our summer's really easy. Everybody comes out back. And, uh, uh, and now, we've already got some really strange comments already, but that's okay. It's just a barbecue. And let the kids play in the backyard, and we'll just get to know them. And maybe through that getting to know them part, um, the love of God will show through and we come to see they can come and know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Maybe I can be enough manna for them that they will desire more of what we have. Amen? Maybe the way I treat my wife or the way she treats me, they'll see that and see that we love each other. Maybe they want to desire that. Amen? Or the way I, I take care of my teenage daughter. Amen? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I know what I've been doing hasn't worked. Open a church up on Sunday morning ain't really reaching the community for the kingdom of God. We have to be 
active in doing that. Amen? And I think to re just refocus on our importance of gathering together for encouragement and going out in community and loving Jesus would be the most important thing. Amen? Okay, I like to say amen because I grew up down south, so everybody's, all the preachers always just say amen. So if you don't like it, well, please say it again when I say that. I just like to hear the response, that's all. I'll let it know you're away. You've got to stay away. Um, 15 more minutes. You give me 15 more minutes? Is that okay? All right. Um, I'm going to run through some scripture verse about hidden treasure, how you're hidden, and how God is um, uh, hidden, but he will reveal himself, right? Isaiah 45, 15 says, Truly you are a God of, that hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior of the world. Isaiah 45, 15. Truly you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And I think God not hiding himself to, to not reveal himself to you. I think God's hiding himself so we seek after him. Huh? Yeah? Colossians 2.3 says, In whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who's that? Jesus. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. Turn there in your Bibles. Or can you get that one up, Richard? Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. Okay, good. My son, if you receive my word and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search her at um, search her, search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge in God. Hallelujah. So saying, seek after God as a hidden treasure, as silver, and, uh, seek after him, and then you will have the understanding of the fear of the Lord. Maybe the church, the problem we ain't growing is we don't have the fear of God because we were told for so many years that you can do anything you want. And I find as I grow closer and closer to God that I can't do anything without him. I can't do anything. I can't make a decision without him. I want him more and more in, in part of my whole life. So if I want understanding, maybe I need the understanding I need to have is the fear of the Lord. Amen? Understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge, and it only comes from God. Amen? Worldly knowledge is great, right? If you're a doctor and you didn't go to school, I mean, I'd have trouble with you working on me. You know what I'm saying? So you need to have worldly knowledge. If you're a mechanic and you went to school and you learned how to work on my car, great. I'm glad that you, you did that. You could work on my car. Amen? I want you to have that knowledge. Right? But there's greater knowledge than that. The God, knowledge that God gives you and me that is an understanding of who He is. How great and wonderful. I mean, think about it. I, I love the, I love the, think about this whole area just a couple months ago was, was snow on the ground, ice everywhere, trees and animal leaves, and just in a moment of a couple weeks, we, is grass, is green. I mean, God is, it just a, it marvels me how big and how wide how God is in everything in our life. Amen? Uh, the treasure um, of the revelation of the sonship is hidden in us. Let me say it again. The treasure of the revelation of sonship is hidden in you and me. God put that in. So let's look at a couple verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Can you put that up? Right? There you go. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this also passing power is from God and in, in, in us. And the first part of that, well, in the version I read, it says, we have this treasure in earthly vessels. Who's the earthly vessels? Yes, Glenda, we are. We have this treasure in us. How do we do that? The Bible says when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you confess Him as Lord, the there's a deposit in you by the Spirit is deposit in you and me. In us is the hidden treasure. The Spirit of God will always reveal to us the things of God, because that's what His purpose is. John 14, 15, and 16. Read that. The why was the Holy Spirit given? So you and I can be taught by Him the things of God. The Holy Spirit leads us uh, and guides us into all truth. Hallelujah. You want to know the truth? Ask the Holy Spirit. It will help you understand, right? He will help you and me. Hallelujah. Proverbs 15, 6. In the house of the righteous there is, a, is much treasure, but in the re, uh, revenue of the wicked there is trouble. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure. It says your body is a temple of what? The Holy Spirit. We are, we house in us as believers 
heart of God, if you will. The Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the things of God. So in us is the, de the secret treasures of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Or I don't know yet. I never heard that before. In us, God wants to reveal through us, because of the Spirit of God in us, who He is. So we have a righteous fear and love for God that He's always wanted us to be from the beginning. A, a daughter and a son that desires to be with their dad. Amen? Desire to be with Father God. How much greater is there to walk with God? I mean, think about it. He knows everything. I like what Tina uh, said a few weeks ago, that uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, can't take an IQ test because He knows everything. Right? You can't measure the intelligence of God. He knows everything. So he's who we're going to partner with to do life together instead of trying to do this on our own. Because I've done it on my own. And it didn't turn out very good. Amen? And, but when I partner with God, things seem to go better. I don't know how to explain it, but it is. God um, will change. I, when I just said that, and I just thought about those guys in that square that just got killed for the gospel. And I'm thinking, how is life better for them now? It can't get any better because they're acting with their, in this life, this physical life, and they're present with God. I remember Sister Terry, a dear friend of ours, passed away and went out of view with Jesus. She had multiple sclerosis for many years, uh, in wheelchair bound and everything. I just pictured her one day dancing in heaven with Jesus. Amen? Because she was bound in that place. She loved God. She'd sing his praises. She could speak still almost, almost up to her. Uh, she was losing her speech towards the end, but still, you know, she just would always confess that Jesus can heal her. Never doubt in her life. And as, as, uh, as multiple sclerosis, if you will, um, can t took some of her muscle movement away from her hands and her, her neck and all those things. She just was bound in that wheelchair, but she never denied Christ. Amen? She always worshiped God. It was just a, what a testimony to her and I mean, to everyone and to her children. That God, no matter what happens, I'm not going to crash. I guess our eternal life, our joy, our peace, our happiness, is that we'll see Him. Our hope is that we'll see Him. I love when young people get on fire for God because they realize the revelation is not about religion and what you can or can't do. It's about knowing the power of God in their lives. Amen? It's not about just, oh, i got to do this activity because mom and dad said or that's what, you know, I'm dragged here to church or whatever. No, it's about the revelation of the power of God in our own individual lives. They can see a freedom in that. It's not bound by the things of this world. It's freedom in Christ and the power of God and the love of God. No matter, you don't have to earn it. It's just there for you to receive. Amen? Does anybody get anything new today? Is this any, any, anything good? All right. Um, we can bring forth this treasure and enrich others. Yeah. Matthew 12, 35 says, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of his evil uh, out of the evil treasures bring forth evil things. So let's look at 12, 25. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Here you go. Uh, 20, uh, 20, 35, brother. I'm sorry. I should have given these notes beforehand. 1235. There you go. A good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in him. So what is the good that's stored up in him? God is good. Right? We were saying it earlier, right? He is good. He is God. This last one. He is Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. I was singing another song in my head. The good man brings good things out of good store of him. And the evil man, he can be the best. And if you are a believer of Jesus Christ and a follower of him, you have good in you. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Last point. Healing glory to tabernacle of Moses was a dwelling place of God on earth. God instructed Moses to make a tabernacle, make a place where he can dwell in. It had to be built a certain way. It had to use certain material. It had to have uh, 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 inner court, if you will. It had to have 
place where they sacrificed the animals. It had a place where the priests had to watch. It had a, a curtain. Inside that first curtain was the, the late was the uh, table of showbread, the table of incense, and uh, the candlesticks there that was representation of the Holy Spirit. And then inside the next curtain, where only the high priest could go, was the tabernacle, where these the manna and the rod and the Ten Commandments, where it's called the mercy seats. And God, through Jesus, said, I no longer dwell in earthly vessels, but he's going to dwell in you. Where is the glory of God? Come on. Right here. Right here. Where is the glory of God? Well, I don't see the glory of God because you're not using it. You're not acknowledging it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? The glory of God is in you and me. Wow. When you... <laughs> When you leave this building and you go into community, the, 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 the life-giving word is in you. The spirit of God is in you. The glory of God is in you. I tell people when we pray, when we pray for people, we've heard me say this many times. When we pray for people and God heals them, I take no glory. I said, let's give all the glory to Jesus because he's the one who does the healing. Amen? And then when people say, what if he doesn't heal somebody? What, what if it doesn't happen? You pray and nothing happened. I'm not going to take any blame either. I'm just going to exercise my faith to believe when I pray, God will do what I ask Him to do. That's what my faith is. I can't take any, I can't take any uh, uh, blame for anything else. What were you going to say? Long suffering. Long suffering. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the power of God is in you and me, and the glory of God is in you. So when you walk into a room, you bring the, everybody should be happy when you're there. You bring the presence of God there. Come on, hey, Jesus is in me. How many get grumpy sometimes? Huh? I have to remind myself that where did the glory go? Huh? Where did Jesus go? If, if this is all in me. Where, did, where is it if I'm supposed to bring it with me? I tell people, I remember my first pastor, Pastor Joe Stenson, would say, we're Christians and we leak. <laughs> right? We leak out and the natural comes in and the spiritual kind of falls away and we get back into you know, our old, old nature, if you will. And that's why we've got to pray. And that's why we've got to read the Word of God so we can fill up with the, the belief of God is Jesus is the Son of God. And we can pray against our unbelief. And we can just pray, God, I don't know. How you been in prayer and you just don't know what to pray? I just feel unworthy to be in your presence, God. I just feel like junk, but I know I'm not because I read the Word. It says I'm your child, and you are blessed me, and you glorify me, and you put your glory in me, and you have your hope in me, and I have all that, but I just don't feel like it today. Come on. And I just sit here, and, and I, I sit down, and I just say, I, God, I'm not saying the word. Because anything I have to say is not any good. We just fill me with your presence. And not after time. And I don't know if it's five minutes, and I don't know if it's ten minutes, and I don't know if it's an hour, but in after time, I feel the presence, and I feel the glory, and I feel the peace that come over me. And I say, okay, God, I can go on now. Amen? And sometimes when we go into prayer, we just need to shut up and just listen to God. To spend time with him. So God's presence. And when people see us, they see Jesus. And they don't see Bob Castrova. Amen? That love would flow from us greater than the love that we have in the natural. Because the love of God is in us. God has for us much, much more than we know. If we're the example of the tabernacle to the world, that we carry with us the love and the grace and the peace and the forgiveness. How many deal with unforgiveness? Don't raise your hand. Somebody wronged you and you're mad at them. Or somebody used you, right? And we deal with that. But God doesn't want us to be an unforgiveness. God says that we should forgive so our Heavenly Father can forgive us. Oh, I can't do it, God. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know how mean they were to me. You don't know what's happened to me. Yes, God knows. Come on. He knows everything. And he's just asking you to say, would you just please forgive them because I forgave you. I was talking with somebody the other day, reminding of a time I had to forgive somebody that I was up here preaching one Sunday morning when we first came. And I was preaching on forgiveness. I was preaching on 
forgiveness. And, I, and, the Holy, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me like he speaks to you sitting there. I get the same thing up here sometimes. And the Holy Spirit says, have you forgiven this particular person? And I said, of course I have. I'm preaching on forgiveness. I, I said it in my mind. I didn't say it out loud to God. And God says, no, uh-uh, you haven't. So I finished up my sermon. I, I finished up the altar time. People responded. They were up here crying because they hadn't forgiven people. And I'm dealing with the same thing. So then I shared this story with a friend of mine who's a pastor. And he says to me, oh, that's great you, forg the, you forgave them. He said it just like this. Oh, you forgave them? And I said, oh, yes, I forgave them. He goes, this, he says this to me. Do they know it? I said, what? I want to hear that. I forgave them. I did what the Word of God says, forgive. And he said, did you? And he said, I ordered McDonald's at, in Wanakee. I'm like, what? Just that loud, too. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to deal with that. I was over in my mind. But it wasn't because it's in my spirit. In my mind, I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm good to go. But in my spirit, I hadn't forgiven them. So I wasn't walking in the glory of God. I was just walking in Bob. So I went home and I looked up on this wonderful thing we call the internet, found his name and his phone number, and once you know I had, I was thinking, well, I'll just make an effort then. I'll go home, I'll look him up on the internet. If I can't find his phone number, I'm off the hook, right? Guess what popped up on the internet? Thanks, God. So then I called and we talked. And I asked him to forgive me, and you know, he, he was like, well, yeah, nothing ever happened. He's like, it, it was no big deal to him. It was like it was over. But it wasn't over, because in my spirit, I was still bound by that unforgiveness that I held in my heart. Not in my mind, because in my mind, everything was cool, but in my heart, I still had this hatred, this uh, hurt that was there. And then finally, after asking him to forgive me, then I started to feel peace about the situation. And God began healing me over what happened. Amen? That's how God works. We need to walk in His glory. We hold back the glory of God when we, we can't forgive people. But God wants us to walk in His glory because the kingdom of God is in us. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, uh, 53 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender tree and as a root out of the ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty in him. I'm just thinking about God. God walked, Jesus walked on this earth as a Jewish man, but he was just like any other Jewish guy. He's like us. We're just normal people doing this thing for God. No special. We don't have to wear a robe saying we're a priest or whatever. That's why I wore this tonight. I just wanted to wear this old, like little clothes. I don't want to wear a suit and tie, Pastor Bob's only special. No. I'm just like everybody else here. I'm just working out my salvation with fear and trembling. So Jesus will be glorified in my life. So you and I will be encouraged to run the race till the very end. Amen? 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 Praise the Lord. Let's stand. I just want to challenge you right now. Uh, we can do this without music too, Tina. Okay. Yeah, we'll just do it without music. What's we'll we'll God doing? Fake spirituality. No. <laughs> Seriously, where are you at with God right now? Where are you at in your heart? All you have to do is seek Him with all your heart, soul, mind, body. Anybody ever heard this before? You ever hear this? So Jesus said, these are the greatest commandments. If you follow these two commandments, you're good. You do these two things. All you have to do is these two things. And everything I talk about today will fall into place. These are the greatest commandments in the whole world. We're, we're a country of laws. I mean, they have more laws than you can ever think about. They make laws and make laws and make laws. Jesus said, just do these two things. Christians, believers, do these two things. Love God. Love God. Study it out with all your heart, soul, mind, body, everything within you. Love. Seek Him. Love Him. Get to know Him. I invite Him over to dinner. Go on a walk with them. Drive in the car with them. Take a shower with them. Know Him. Because He's speaking to you constantly. All my heart, all my soul, everything within me, I want to know God. And he did, He's not hiding in a sense of 
that you'll never find him. He's just playing hide and go seek, if you will. Come and seek me, and you'll find me. And I'll lavish my love upon you and give you peace. And he said this, Jesus said this in his own words, and then love people. You mean those people? Love God and love people. In this you show the very, you fulfill every law of the prophets, every, every prophecy, every law is fulfilled in those two things. Loving God and loving people. Oh Lord, help me, help me to love you, Father God, with all my heart, with all my soul. Come on, folks, just pray. Ask God, help me to love you with everything within me, God that I may be the light of the world for your kingdom. And Father God, our mission is to love people. Help me to love others as you love them, Father God. Help me to even do good to the, my enemies. And help me to forgive those that you brought to my heart this morning that your love may shine in their lives. And Father, over the people right now, I pray your peace. I pray you shine your face upon each one and give them peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. We're gonna, Tina and I are going to be up here for a few minutes. If you need prayer for anything, just come on up here. If not, you're dismissed. Love you. Thank you for coming. Seek him this week. Amen? Amen. God bless you.